Hello everybody and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. Uh, today we're going to talk about the quirky songs by The Beatles. Uh, the Beatles are known for their rock songs and their pop songs and their romantic songs, and but they had a quirky side to them too. Uh, so we're going to discuss that today. Uh, the first song on the quirky scale is You Know My Name, Look Up My Number. And this came from the White Album. And I always had a liking for this song. I don't know why. I mean, it was kind of just a crazy song. And I didn't know the, too much when I first heard that about the Beatles' personalities. I didn't, I wasn't as into the Beatles' personal lives as I was their music then. But uh, now I'm, you know, I like, can't stop reading all about them. And, and this is so John Lennon, this song. <laughs> Uh, according to Wikipedia, John stated that uh, that this was a piece of unfinished music that I turned into a comedy record with Paul. I was waiting for him in his house, and I saw the phone book was on the piano with, you know, the name, look up the number. That was like a logo, and I just changed it. And McCartney once told Beatles recording an analyst, Mark Lewis, John Lewis, people are only just discovering things like, you know my name, look up my number probably my favorite Beatles track. He went on to explain, it's so insane, all the memories. I mean, what would you do if a guy like John Lennon turned up at the studio and said, I got a new song? And I said, what's the words? And he replied, you know my name, look up the number. And I asked, uh, what's the rest of it? Uh, no, no other words, these are the words, and I want to do it like a mantra. Uh, I love how the song starts out very simple with a drum and the piano and hand claps and then sounds like a comedy routine with the improvs by John and repetitive lyrics. It's neat to listen to Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones play the alto sax. It sounds like they're doing a bit of, uh, of a Bing Crosby imitation and it's a cool song. And only John could make a song out of an ad in the phone book and that shows tell. Uh, but John wasn't through being quirky. Uh, the next song he came up with was I Am The Walrus from the album Magical Mystery Tour, and that was uh, created because John wanted to confuse the listeners who were trying to interpret the Beatles' lyrics. Um, this song works wonderfully uh, with lyrics like sitting on a cornflake and yellow matter custard, green slop pie, all mixed together with a dead dog's eye. Kind of gross the last part, but it is memorable. It is said that John was inspired by Procol Harum song, Whiter Shade of Pale, and it's a favorite song of John's in 1967. And LSD and that inspired him in the weird feel of the song. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, the next song is I Dig a Pony. Uh, the song came from the album Let It Be. This is a short song written and sung by John Lennon. It had a lot of soul sound to it with Billy Preston playing the Hammond organ. And John called it one of his garbage songs, but it's interesting to hear words that just pop in the song with no meaning. You have uh, uh, like a Rolling Stone, like the C FBI and the CIA and the BBC and BB King is like thoughts were just bouncing off his head and then he just wrote it down. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, and Doris Day, Matt Busby, dig it, dig it, dig it, and on with the dig it. <laughs> and, uh, then he said at the end, that was Can You Dig It by Georgie Wood. And now we'd like to do Hark the Angels Come. Uh, this song just has a groove. Too bad it wasn't a little bit longer. Uh, next on the list is Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except Me and My Monkey. And this comes from the White Album. And it seems like some of the quirky songs are coming from the White Album, as we'll see in a little while, because this isn't the only song that's uh, coming from there rocks with everyone doing hand claps and and George Harrison's playing a piercing lead guitar. John plays rhythm guitar and Paul plays bass and the bells. Paul is so musical he could play anything and make it sound good. And John said that this song was about him and Yoko. <laughs> so everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey was written about John Lennon's future wife. So John said of the song uh, that was just sort of a nice line that I made into a song. It was about me and Yoko. Everybody seemed to be paranoid except for us two, who were in the glow of love. Everything is clear and open when you're in love. 
Everybody was sort of tense around us, you know. What's she doing here at this session? Why is she with him? All the sort of madness going on around us because we just happen to want to be together all the time. Um, John Lennon said that for all we are saying interview. Now, the other Beatles felt the song was about heroin because John and Yoko were taking heroin at this time and the other Beatles weren't. And John likes the jangly, jangly guitar and this song jangles. Uh, the ending is cool with all the come on, come on, ending the song. Okay, now we have uh, Maxwell's Silver Hammer by Paul McCartney. He's getting into the quirky side too with this song and this comes from the Abbey Road album. Um, this is the first we have on the list, as I said, about Paul McCartney. And this sounding sounds so cheery with an old-fashioned Baldwinian music hall sound. And then we have the dark lyrics about a student named Maxwell that's bashing people in the head with a hammer. Um, Paul stated that this song was symbolic of the downfalls of life, being an analogy for when something goes wrong out of the blue, as it so often does. Uh, John came in about a week after he'd been in a car crash and then had to listen as they worked on the song over and over. It sounds like it's as painful as a toothache, but this is what was said, uh, John said about it. The recording process subsequently drew unfavorable comments from Lennon, George, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr. Lennon said, I was ill after the accident, and when they did most of that track, and it was really ground, uh, George and Ringo into the ground recording it. Uh, uh, later, I hate it because all I remember is the track. Paul did everything to make it into a single, and it never was, and it never could have been. In the recollection of engineer Jeff Emmerich, Lennon dismissed it as more of Paul's granny music, and Harrison recalled, uh, Sometimes Paul would make us do these really fruity songs. I mean, my God, Maxwell's Silver Hammer was so fruity. After a while, we did a good job on it, but when Paul got an idea on an arrangement in his head, and then Starr told Rolling Stone in 2008, the worst session ever was Maxwell's Silver Hammer. It was the worst track we ever had to record. It went on for weeks. I thought I was it was mad. And McCartney recalled, the only arguments were about things like me spending three days on Maxwell's Silver Hammer. And I remember George saying, you're taking three days. It's only a song. And yeah, but I want to get it right. I got some thoughts on this one. I always liked the British music hall sound, but the lyrics uh, were not for me. Uh, this is me speaking. Uh, it was a little gruesome with the lyrics. Okay, the next up for quirky songs is Octopus Garden. Octopus's Garden from the Abbey Road album. It's a song that George and Ringo wrote together, even though George uh, said that Ringo wrote it all by himself. Uh, I think George really helped him to write this song. Uh, Ringo stated, I wrote, in, I wrote the Octopus's Garden in Sardinia. Uh, Peter Seller said, Lennis is yacht, and we went out for the day, and I stayed out on the deck with the captain, and we talked about octopuses, and he told me that they hang out in their caves, and they go around the seabed finding shiny stones and tin cans and bottles to put in front of their cave like a garden. I thought, this is fabulous, because at the time I just wanted to be under the sea, too. A couple of tokes later with the guitar, and we had octopuses garden. I think everyone can relate to this song, where one just wants to escape to a peaceful place with no worries. Thinking about the octopus which is romping around under the water sounds great. And Ringo wrote a great song. Okay, not to be outdone, uh, George Harrison makes the list with his song, Piggies. Now, this song came from the White Album again, and it was uh, written and performed by George Harrison. George said he wrote it as a social commentary, and it was inspired by Animal Farm by George Orwell. And George got a little help writing this song, first by his mom, and she came up with the line, what they needs a damn good wagon. And then John Lennon came up with the end lyric. He turned uh, George's original line uh, to cut their pork chops to John's line, clutching forks and knives to eat their bacon, which is so much better. Um, this song has a classical sound to it, Baroque sound, with the harpsichord, strings and cellos. Leave it to George to come up with a song that is a song of greed and social status. Last on the list is another song by George, and it's called S Savoy Truffle, and this is again from the White Album. Um, this song really sounds like it came from an Austin Powers movie. I love that psychedelic 60s sound, and the song was inspired by his friend Eric Clapton and his love for chocolate candy. Uh, Eric seems to be an inspiration in some of George's songs. 
And the other song that comes to mind is Here Comes the Sun, written by George when he was in Eric Clapton's garden. But um, George saying about the song Savoy Truffle uh, in an interview said um, he was known to depart from his image as a mystical Beatle George and now he wanted to give tribute songs without any profound message. He wrote Savoy Truffle as a tribute to Cl Clapton's Sweet Tooth and he derived the title and much of the lyrics from a box of Macintosh's Good News Chocolates, which Clapton began eating during one of his visits to Harrison's home. Many of the confectionery names used in the song are authentic. Others, such as cherry cream, coconut fudge, and pineapple heart, were Harrison's invention, uh, based on the flavors listed inside the lid of the box. Uh, the Beatles were so talented, and this is what, I mean, they could take any kind of song and make it special and timeless, and they sure did that with these songs. So thank you for the quirky songs. I think we all appreciate them so much. And I appreciate everybody listening. Um, I hope that you will subscribe and I hope you will tune in again to the, the, the Beatles forever because uh, we have much more topics to go over and there's just never enough time. So thank you everybody and have a good day. Bye.